we do in life. It goes in eternity. Transcending time and space, let us take you to the place inside your mind where thoughts divide and mysteries unwind. Join us every Monday evening right here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. And you will catch the Fenton Perspective with our great host, Lorian Fenton. Come listen in as she shares her amazing it's very real, but fear is a choice. We are all telling ourselves a story. You're listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. 100% listener-supported radio. Reporting to danger. Unafraid. Right here, where information never sleeps. Revolution. Revolution. Radio. Radio. PM Studio A. Right here, Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, where information never sleeps. Freedomslips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Welcome back, everybody. Don't forget, you're listening to Talk Now Radio, listener-supported radio, where uh, no topic is taboo, brought to you by Revolution Radio, Listener supported radio where information never sleeps. Um, I tried during uh, the break time to get my next guest on the line, Debbie, and uh, I think she had answered her phone and heard the music and was not aware that that's what she'd be hearing when I called and not knowing what it was hung back up. So I decided to wait until we got past break time music and I'm going to try to call her again right now where I can speak to her so she'll know who it is. Hello. Hello, Debbie. Yeah. Hi, this is Royce from Talk Now Radio. I'm calling you live on the air from the show. I did try to call you a few minutes during break time. Uh, you might have answered it and heard the music and didn't know it was me. No, there was a sales call came in at the same time, and when I hung up, it hung up on both of you. Oh, is that what it was? <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, well, That's all right. We got you live on the air now, so we can start from there. Um, I saw your picture on your book over at I think it was Amazon, and it caught my attention. So I thought that it, people here would like to know how to clear their houses from ghosts. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself at first, so that we kind of get an idea what got you interested in writing this book. Um, I've been ghost hunting for over 30 years, and that's the first question everyone always asks me is, how do I get rid of them? And so I decided, well, it's time to let people in on the secret, I guess. So that's what got me interested in writing the book. So I'm going to assume without reading your book that what you got in this book are things that everybody can try at home. They don't need any ghost hunters to help them. Is that correct? That's correct. But I also put in there when you need to call for other help, like if you're dealing with a ne- some type of negative entity. Because I don't want, you know, people really messing with them for their own safety. Okay, so you got uh, information in there about when to call. Do you have who you're going to call? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I just uh, passed the opportunity. I know, I know. It was an easy shot. Um <laughs> You know, I told the, I basically told them, you know, try to find a good ghost hunting team, what to ask them to make sure you're getting someone, you know, professional who knows what they're doing. Um, my email's in the book. They can always email me. I can try to help them from here, which I do a lot. and Or I can refer them to another team I know. Just so I make sure that these people are getting in good hands. Okay. Well, listeners, if y'all are interested in learning a little bit more about Debbie and about her book, you can go to www.myparanormaladvisor.com. And she has links to her book there and uh, other stuff as well. As a matter of fact, you're um, you're technically not a ghost hunter. You're more of a psychic. Is that correct? I'm more of a medium. I'm more of a psychic medium. But everything started with ghost hunting. I mean, it's just kind of natural being a medium to get into ghost hunting, at least for me it was. Okay, well, then if you're a medium, I would assume that maybe part of what's in your book is, uh, you know, getting rid of ghosts by talking to them, maybe? That's the main, that's actually, whether you're a medium or not, that's actually the easiest way to get rid of them. You know, most of the time, ghosts just want to be acknowledged in some way, which is why they're behaving in certain ways. So a lot of times if you acknowledge them and explain that, you know, this isn't their house and they need to leave and you're calm but assertive, I mean, there's no reason to provoke or yell at a ghost. Um, It doesn't do anyone any good. And many times, you know, it might take two or three times to talk to them, but many times that's actually the easiest way. And it's the way I use most often, and you don't have to be a medium to talk to them out loud. But this sometimes doesn't work on rare occasion, I take it? No, on other occasions, you know, you might need to use, um, you know, smudging. You might need to call in someone to help you. Um, you can, there's a lot of folklore around how to get rid of ghosts. So, you know, I find whatever works for you, uh, prayer to St. Michael. I've actually you know, heard of that before. Yeah, there's a spiritual warfare prayer um, to St. Michael. Well, it's really Archangel Michael. And that's also very effective, you know, calling on a higher power. Now, I take it that most of the information we're talking about is solely specifically geared at ghosts. If you got demonic activity, you need an entirely different book? If you need an entirely, yes. If you have demonic activity... Don't even mess with it. Call in someone who knows what they're doing and how to deal with them. Because a lot of times, if you try to get rid of them yourself, you're just going to make matters worse. So I just tell people, you know, fear is the enemy. Stay calm. Be a little proactive, but don't do anything to antagonize it. You know, it's like a lion in a cage. If you're dealing with a demonic, you don't go in there and poke it with a stick. Well, not unless you want to get poked back. (laughs) Yeah, really hard. Yeah. <laughs> I had a friend named Sky, uh, Sierra Sky, once that uh, had went out in one of these ma- malevolent spirits that actually attached to her, and she brought it back home with her. That happens. It's one of the hazards of being a ghost hunter. You know, there's things that follow you home all the time. 
Um, you, you, you just need to learn how to protect yourself. You can draw down a white light to protect you before you go in. Um, a lot of teams will use a smudge stick and smudge, um, like, yeah, which is just sage and sweetgrass, and smudge each member before they leave a location. You know, if you, um, yeah, some types of, you know, amulets, like if you're, you know, religious across or whatever you feel gives you the most power, the most protection. It's a personal choice. So actually it's not the uh, smudging or the cross or the amulet that's actually protecting you. They're really tools by which you strengthen your own faith or gives you something to build your faith on, and that faith is what's actually protecting you. Right. The most important thing is, is no matter how you protect yourself, you have to believe 100% that it's going to work or nothing will work. And that's what I tell people about getting rid of ghosts and spirits. If you don't believe 100% that what you're doing is going to work, it's not going to work. And if you do believe, then you won't need the other tools. That's, depending on the ghost, that's probably right. That's probably right. But the main thing is not to provoke. You know, don't scream and yell. Um, that's all a negative emotion. And with some types of negative emotion, it actually makes the spirit in the house more powerful. Not only that, if you're in a house that's got a demon possession all over it, and you're mistaking it for ghostly activity, and you're cussing it out and yelling all kinds of absurdities at it, you're liable to find yourself in a serious danger in a serious quick fast. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It'll happen real fast. Um, you know, you antagonize a negative entity, and you're going to get quite a strong reaction back and probably not something you're expecting. Or wanting, for that matter. Yeah, well, that's a definite. That's a given. You know, I mean, I've been doing this 30 years. I've come up against four demonics. And neither, none of those experiences have been pleasant. I wouldn't think so. But uh, you say you've been doing it for how many years again? 30? Oh, about 30 years, yeah. And in 30 years, you've only ran into four demonics. I'd say that that's a pretty small ratio for the amount of time you've been at it. Well, yeah, demons are actually very rare. You know, um, you know, I always get people, I think I have a demon in my house, and it's like, well, what makes you think that? And then they tell me what's going on. I'm like, no, that's not a demon. If it was a demon, you would definitely know. The activity escalates to a level most people can't imagine. Um, the whole energy of the house changes. It becomes heavy, thick. The air feels very thick. Um you can definitely tell the well, difference. Can you tell the difference between poltergeist activity and demon activity? Um, yeah, you know, I generally can. Um, a poltergeist activity, while it may seem violent in some cases, you know, they're throwing things, turning lights on and off, stuff like that. A, a, a demon, they're more into psychological warfare. While they can display great feats of uh, physical violence. Um, a poltergeist doesn't really come close to that. I know some people think poltergeists are a former demon. I don't I don't think they are. Well, I know I read a book by Michael Clarkson once called, um, I think it was titled Paranormal Phenomena, if I remember correctly. And he went into a bunch of research that had been done on the poltergeist activity. And... Um, what his findings seemed to indicate was uh, poltergeist uh, guys activity was actually coming from adolescents anywhere from uh, 10 to 16 years of age uh, that had been um, they had emotional disturbances and they were really upset and it was actually the power of their minds that was causing the uh, furniture refrigerators easy chairs whatever it was to move on its own or what appeared to be on its own because whenever these uh, kids were not around the activity was not occurring, in other words. Yes, yes, I totally agree with that. Um, in the book I did, Is Your House Haunted, I went into that study um, about adolescents in the home and how they can cause poltergeist activity. I, I truly think that happens. You know, if there, isn't a, if there isn't an adolescent in the home and there's poltergeist activity, then you have to look at something else. Yeah, and I think one of the things that it was pointed out uh, by Michael on this here was the fact that uh, young adolescents, they're going through a highly 
and I mean extremely highly uh, emotional charged time of their life, uh, the adolescent stage is some of the roughest and, you know, most temperamental times for any teenager. So it's easy to see where they'd have that extra uh, mental power behind that emotional charge, in other words. Right, and they're really not aware that they're doing it. They have, and they can't control it at all. Which is the it, dangerous part. <laughs> it, it is a day They can't control it. They don't even realize they're doing it. But in that situation, you will notice that most of the activity does center around that teenager. Okay. But if there's not a teenager in the house, well, you know, you got to look at something else. Now, I'm pretty sure it's easy to tell the difference between a, a poltergeist and a ghost because uh, I think ghosts aren't able to move heavy things like refrigerators or easy chairs. Uh, they can only like do little things like pictures. Is that right? Or am I guessing? Yeah. Um, I think that depending on how powerful or how strong the spirit is, I think they can move furniture. I'm well, we know in poltergeist activity that's been known to happen. I just don't remember reading or hearing about it happening in ghostly activity. That don't mean it has. It just means maybe I hadn't found that book yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, we've had cases where we haven't had a poltergeist and we've had a ghost and... Um, you know, they've they've been pretty bizarre. I mean, they've moved some things I didn't think they could move either. I mean, while they tend to concentrate on, um, you know, electronic devices, opening cabinets, closing cabinets, you know, basic stuff, um, odors, there's another one. Um, they're capable, I believe, of doing a whole lot more than I think some people give them credit for. And I just don't think they they see the need because you have to look at the amount of energy it would take a spirit to do that. I would think quite a lot because you're talking yeah. about something without substance, moving something with substance. Yeah, I mean, in one of the houses I lived in, we had these rocking recliners and they swiveled. And I had a ghost that took great delight in just spinning that spinning the chairs around like crazy. You know, I mean, they weren't hard to do. It wasn't hard to spin, but it still took energy for them to do it. And they they do it. Um, I had a ghost that would uh, switch pictures on the wall. You know, they'd take one picture, put it somewhere else on the wall, and move that picture over to the, where the other one was. I had that happen. So I figured out who it was, and I solved that problem. So um, have you seen any cases of uh, ghosts being evil or malevolent just like a demon would be? I know, I've i seen a couple that were perceived that way. Um, at first, I even thought they were pretty malevolent. Uh, but in all but one case, it turned out to be the ghost was just desperate and acting out any way it could to get attention. In the one case I had where it was malevolent, um, it was just a ghost. They were pushing people downstairs. They were shoving people. They were, um, you know, just totally wiping out tables. Um, not, I mean, like the whole table, but if there was anything on the table, that stuff would just go flying. And it was usually aimed at a person. Uh, so, yeah, I have run into malevolent spirits. Was this uh, mostly in cases, though, where they had been provoked? No. No, the um, in the one case I had, uh, the, when they were alive, the person had not been a very nice person, and they definitely were not a nice person in death. So if so, you know Ken Tankerous old coot, if you meet him on the other side, they'll probably still be Ken Tankerous. Yeah, yeah, that was the case with this ghost anyway. You know, it was, uh, he was pretty Ken Tankerous in life, and he didn't improve any in death, and it took a little bit to get rid of him, but, uh, you know, he's he's gone. And he, he happened to have been the landlord of the property. Makes me wonder if maybe people like that reincarnate cantankerous. Have they, I don't know. I, I mean, it, it depends on if you believe in karma. You know, if you believe in karma and in one life you're very rich and you're greedy and you don't help out someone less fortunate than you in the next life... You might come back as someone less fortunate and run into a person who's greedy, and it's karma. 
you know, it's meant to teach. So there's no indication really that maybe when people get up there in heaven or on the other side, they're like, oh, my God, that's what I was like. I want to go back and do it right this time. I think that maybe some of them were, but um, not all for sure. You know, I've run into a few that um, for different motivations, you know, they weren't real nice in life and they carried that over into death. And, you know, it depends on the motivation of the spirit. You know, one one spirit I know very well um, tried to push people down the stairs all the time from the third floor down to the second floor. If they were coming up the third floor stairs, they would get pushed. And he just didn't want anyone in his house. That was his space. The people were invading his space. So he was just letting them know, I don't want anyone up here. This is my space. I've heard of that happening before, too. Have you run into any cases where, uh, like, scratches or bruising was occurring? Yes. You know, that's personally happened to me a few times. What's that? You know, but Scratch we, or bruise we, or both? <laughs> uh, both. Not, not by the same spirit, but, yeah, I mean, you, know, you, you, you can't go out looking for this stuff and not expect to run into something that's going to hurt you eventually. I mean, it's just going to happen. Um if you're like me and you're a medium, it tends to draw more attention, so they're going to go after you because they're afraid. They're scared that you're going to make them leave or they don't want you there. And that's what I normally run into anyway. I mean, they won't they won't bother my team, but the second I walk in the house, they'll just they they target me, and that's fine. I'd rather have them come at me than my team. Hmm. Okay. Now, what about some of these spirits that we hear about on TV that uh, they were, like, say, slaves for cruel ma- uh, masters back in the 1600s or so, and their spirits still to this day haunt houses or land property and stuff like that? Or uh, Are there any ways to help these here uh, spirits move on out of this realm or to uh, even make them do it against their will? Um, first thing you need to do is make sure that you're not dealing with residual energy, that there's actually a spirit there. And if there is, you know, I just, I talk to them. I try to get them to go into the light. Um, I try not to force a spirit if I don't have to, unless it's malevolent. Um, that's just my thing. Um, I, usually the, the spiritual warfare prayer to St. Michael that usually helps them across, but mostly it's just talking to them. I, I try to be as gentle as I can with them, given what they went through in life. But, I mean, if you have someone, you know, like down at the Myrtle's Plantation or something, you know, Chloe's not going to leave. You know, she's she's not done. She had a violent death. She's not going to leave. And maybe there's something holding there or there. I don't know. I haven't been there yet, but... I, I just talked to him. Kind of yeah, reminds like me of the White different. House. I mean, I, I said it kind of reminds me of the White House because I've uh, heard tell the White House was on it, and some of those spirits had violent deaths. I've heard that, you know, uh, I've heard that too. I've heard that Abraham Lincoln Lincoln's ghost has been seen more than once. You know, but a lot of times ghosts come back to the place they liked in life, you know, which would be the case with him. And he wasn't done yet. You know, he was assassinated during his presidency. He he was not done. You know what uh, I bet George Washington would say if he saw, uh, and of course George Washington was before Abraham Lincoln, but if it was the other way around and he did see uh, Abraham Lincoln's ghost come into his room, I bet he'd probably say, I cannot tell a lie. I am scared of you. (laughs) That could could be. (laughs) You know, I've often wondered if that ghost actually scare each other. You know, I mean, I know they go they go to war with each other, and if they're occupying the same place, sometimes I've had that happen once. Do tell, I haven't. This is the first I've heard of that. Well, we were doing this. Uh, we were doing a church, and uh, there was a gentleman in the newer part of the church that um, had kind of been almost like a caretaker. Like he worked in the gardens, and you know, he'd go in and clean the church. He just he loved to serve the church. And then in the old part of the church, there was another caretaker that had 
been the caretaker when the church was originally built. And they were kind of having a little argument about who was the caretaker, and they were scaring teenagers, and, you know, they were kind of wrecking a little bit of havoc. Nothing serious, nothing um, dangerous. They were just having a little turf war. So, you know, I went in there and kind of listened to both stories and said, look, here's the deal. You stay in this part, you stay in this part. Just, just stop this. It's ridiculous. This is the church. The verbal and, equivalent of drawing a piece of tape down the middle of the room. Yeah, 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 basically is what I did. Because there was a threshold, a doorway between the old part of the church and the new part of the church. So I said, you stay in this part, you stay in this part. You take care of what you took care of when you were alive. You take care of this part, and everybody will be happy. And uh, quit scaring the teenagers. And that's pretty much what happened. Okay. Now, I would like to remind everybody that we do have phone lines here, and right now nobody's occupying them but me and the guests. Uh, don't <laughs> be bashful, guys. Call in at 347-688-2902. I know you're out there because I see you in the chat room. Call in and say hello. Uh, ask a question. Let it, let people know that you're listening. <laughs> So I also want to throw that in there real quick with everybody listening. So real quick, like, why don't you give us an idea, without giving away the candy store, what all we'll find in your book when, if we buy it and read it? Um, you're going to find how to tell different kind of entities, like whether it's good, bad, um, kind of almost what kind of spirit it is. Like if you're dealing with a poltergeist or a demonic, you're going to find a lot of ways to uh, get rid of a ghost. You're going to find a lot of folklore on how to get rid of a ghost. I mean, my favorite is someone said a uh, piece of folklore is to throw rice on the kitchen floor and the ghost will get so busy counting it that it'll get frustrated and leave, which I thought was pretty funny. Um, one was turn your shoes, one, one in one direction, one in the other direction at the end of the bed, and it'll confuse the ghost and they'll leave. There's just it's there's just a lot of stuff out there that was just too cute not to put in. Um, the big thing I talk about is um, fear. I think I did almost a whole chapter on fear because fear is the enemy when you're dealing with a ghost. So I try to give people ways to be proactive in the book so they're not so afraid. Um, keep a journal of the activity. You write down weather conditions, what room, who was home, what happened. Because um, eventually, if you have to call in a paranormal investigator, that's valuable information. And pretty soon you'll see a pattern emerge. In most cases, you'll find a pattern. And it makes it easier for you to deal with the ghost and for us to deal with the ghost when we get in there because we pretty much know what we're going after. You know, try to avoid um, negative emotions, like if it's, you know, uh, an abusive, abusive situation. Um, a lot of people believe that um, feng shui, uh, how you arrange your furniture and how which way the house faces, that, that has a lot to do with keeping out ghosts. So that's in there. Um, I tried to cover a lot of different ways, a lot of different cultures, a lot of different um, ways to look at it. There's, there's a little something for everybody. Everybody and everything. <laughs> everything. I just I didn't want to gear it to one particular culture, or one relig particular religion. You know, I want people to do what's going to work for them and what they can believe in 100 percent, because that's the most important thing. Okay. Now, is there anything in there about using dowsing rods to find ghosts? Because I've heard of that. I've heard of that. Um, I've seen people do it. I have not done it. Um, we had a, um, I was helping out a, a historical society and, uh, there was a old graveyard and while a lot of the graves were marked, a lot of them weren't. And, uh, someone went out there with a dousing rod and every time they would cross over a grave, the rods would cross. So I found that pretty interesting. There's a person on our team that uses dousing rods and they seem to be very effective. I've actually seen a guy that used them, and he was doing it in a graveyard also, and he was given a class on how to use them. As I understand it, you don't do anything other than lightly hold them. Uh, I mean, uh, hold them enough where you can't or won't drop them or not likely to drop them, but yet loose enough that they can move back and forth without any help from you. 
Yes. Yes. And then when you come across something, it could be metal, it could be, um, you know, water was, dowsing rods were used to find water for years. You know, it could be a grave. You know, it could be a lot of things. And, you know, a lot of times, whatever's there is tied to the land. I mean, there's a whole area in Michigan up north. It's like two square blocks of this town, and a lot of the houses are having paranormal activity, and it's got to be tied to the land somewhere. I just haven't figured it out yet. I think the reason dowsing rods seem to have a a strong ratio of working has to do with energy. I mean, there's energy in water, which would explain why it finds the water. There's uh-huh. uh, ghosts are composed of energy. Actually, so are humans, for that matter. Actually, right. almost everything. Everything is, is energy. Everything is energy. But I guess when you get, uh, it's able to pick up on the different signatures of different energy. And what happens is when they crosses the rods, it's kind of like making a circle or a circuit, because all all electricity in order to work has to make a circuit. Right, and I've also heard of people um, cleansing their rods, you know, put them in salt water and cleansing them, getting negative energies out, and then um, putting them out either in the light of the sun or the light of the moon, whatever they prefer, to charge them. And then when they pick them up again, they put their intent into it, whether they want it to use for ghosts or they're trying to find water or they're looking for precious metals or something like that. They're actually putting their intent into the rods, and that's what those rods are going to find. I've heard of it ha- that happening. Sounds like a that's similar funny. principle to magnetizing a screwdriver. Yeah, or you, you can do the same with crystals. You know, okay. you can put your intent in, into a crystal um, once it's been cleansed and charged. I've actually heard tell about crystals, uh, and I'm assuming you're talking quartz here. Um, um, quartz, amethyst, you know, any mineral... Any kind, any type of crystal, as long as you cleanse them and charge them properly, you know you can pretty much put your intent into them. Some crystals, like amethyst, are used for specific things, like healing for an amethyst. Um, I mean, I do it with um, with my crystals. I charge and put my intent into them. I'll cleanse and do that with a pendulum if I'm using a pendulum. Um, so this works in many different. Uh many different things. It's not just crystals alone. It could be metal or anything else. You could put your intent on it. Yeah, you know, something porous. You know, it has to be porous because it needs to absorb energy. Just like if you're dealing with, you know, a haunted building or a haunted object. You know, the energy has been absorbed into that object or building and then it just manifests itself. I mean, with buildings, I find that's mostly residual energy because the rocks or the wood or whatever the building's made of that's porous has absorbed the energy from events of the past. And um, a lot of times that'll replay itself. And people think the place is haunted, but it's really not. It's just this little piece of time caught in some kind of continuum and it just keeps replaying itself over and over and over. I've run into that. I had that in one of my houses, actually. Okay, so what I'm hearing, if I got this understood correctly, is the more porous it is, it acts more like a sponge. The less porous, the harder the time that its energy has penetrating it because it's uh, it's too solid. Right. I mean, there's been cases um, out east where Civil War buildings have been torn down, but the blocks and the bricks have been used as foundations for other buildings. And they've reported what they, what some people perceive as paranormal activity, but it's really just a lot of it is just that energy stored in those bricks or those blocks that was used, just replaying itself a past event over and over. There's not really a ghost there. It's just the event that stuck because it was absorbed into those stones. Speaking of that kind of energy, because you touched bases on it earlier and I didn't pursue it at the time. Um, I've heard of this theory of conscious energy being left behind as a signature where people have died at. How does a person go about telling if they're dealing with this here kind of energy signature versus a real ghost? Um, there's a couple ways. Like, if you're dealing with a real ghost, 
we would call that an intelligent entity. And that entity is going to, at some point, make an attempt to communicate with the living or they're going to acknowledge the living in some way. If it's residual energy, it could even appear as a full-body apparition, but it's really not. It's just the energy, and it's not even going to acknowledge there's a human there. Those are the ones that, like, walk through walls where doors used to be, that kind of thing. It's just residual energy. It's not really a ghost. It'll scare the bejeebers out of you, but it's not really a ghost. So it's easier to get a picture of uh, residual energy than it is to get a picture of a ghost. Yeah, definitely. You know, like a lot of people report hearing, well, every night at 3 o'clock I hear in the morning, I hear footsteps down the hall or the back door opening and closing. That's residual. I mean, there's probably someone that lived there that every night it came home from work or whatever at 3 a.m., came up the stairs, and it's just, it was so repetitious that event just became part of the energy of the house, and it's just going to replay itself. Um, in one house I lived in, it was owned by my uh, great-grandfather. In fact, he built it. And in April and in the fall, it sounded like this huge metal weight hit the basement, the cement basement floor, and it'd wake you up at 4 o'clock in the morning. And we'd run downstairs. There'd be nothing out of the place. Well, then I found out that he used to be a mushroom farmer, and in the spring and the fall when he had to plow, he would let the plow drop from the ceiling down to the cement floor and then be drug out the window by the horses to plow the field. So it was just residual. Hmm. So since I was the main cook of the house, or the only cook for, I don't know, well over 20 years, 23 years or more, I would assume that after I pass away, uh, my family might expect to see me standing in front of the stove uh, trying to cook during the middle of the night if they get up for a drink or something. It's possible. It's possible, or you might really be there trying to cook at 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, <laughs> it's the key. <laughs> the key of the whole thing is, is whatever is there making an attempt to communicate with the living, or do they acknowledge the living in some way? That's the key. If it acknowledges the living or attempts to communicate, then it's a ghost. It's an intelligent entity, what we would call intelligent. So if I, uh, if I got slapped by uh, something that's likely to be a, a ghost and not an energy. It, yeah, it's likely to be an intelligent entity, and you did something that really ticked it off, yeah. Or it just wanted me to know it wasn't energy. <laughs> yeah, or it just wanted you to let you know it was there. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I had a ghost wake me up at 3 o'clock in the morning oh, years ago. My kids were still little. And we lived in my great-grandfather's house. This energy literally was shaking me awake. And, it, well, I knew it wasn't a relative because there was an entity in the home I never identified. There were three entities in that house. This one I couldn't figure out. And I knew it was that entity, and I woke up, and the house was freezing. And I checked the thermometer, the temperature thing, and the furnace had gone out. So I woke up my husband. And, and it was an old, old, old oil furnace that had been converted to coal. And he turned off the oil going to the furnace, and we called a repairman. And the repairman told us if we had not woken up the house and turned off the oil, the house could have exploded. So the ghost actually saved my life and the life of my kids. Okay. So I was kind of glad he was there. He was around. He kind of I think I would have house. been, too. <laughs> yeah, he, he kind of watched out for us. He was very protective of the house and the people in it. He always was like that. Ever since I was a little girl, I remember being there a little girl, and he was always very protective. All right. Now, I also want to ask you to uh, tell my listeners a little something about your website and what you do there. Um, ParanormalAdvisor.com. It's just kind of, you know, a little update about what I do. Um, they can find me on WordPress at allaboutghost.wordpress.com. That's got a ton of information on it. They can find me on Facebook uh, at the Paranormal Realm. And um, I don't use the website that much. I, I have to get back to that. they are mostly using um, All About Ghosts at wordpress.com and um, the Facebook. Paranormal Realm on Facebook, yeah. 
It's Fair yeah. Noble Realm. Is that a, a like page or is that a, a group? It's a like page. It's a fan page. But people people can post on it um, at allaboutghost.wordpress.com. There's an Ask Debbie section. They can ask me a question. Um, there's a lot of information about ghosts on there, different kinds of ghosts, how to talk to your kids about ghosts, uh, that type of stuff. Kids are hard, you know, to talk about ghosts too sometimes. I can understand that. So, well, you know, a lot of times the kids say they have an imaginary friend, and you know that's normal. Kids, you know, have imaginary friends, but if that imaginary friend starts to tell them to do things that they shouldn't be doing, then you really got to start paying attention. So, that'd be the takeaway from that: pay attention when they talk about their imaginary friends. Uh, pay attention, you know, if they keep on saying, "Well, there's a man in my room," or "There's a dark shadow in my room," or you know, something like that, you know, a lot of people dismiss that, oh, they're just being a kid, they had a bad dream. Well, not, you know, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Okay. Because, you know, ki- kids are the most vulnerable. Yeah, they, I can imagine they really are because they, uh, well, they're like sponges. They they just attract information and not always the information you want them to. Well, exactly, and they, they're more open. You know, they can accept everything as it comes because they haven't been programmed not to. They haven't been programmed, don't believe in ghosts. They haven't been programmed by Hollywood and television. Or the church. <laughs> or the church. Or the church. You know, they, they haven't been programmed yet. They're, you they're know, still they're in the process of being programmed by the school. <laughs> yeah, you know, but they're innocent. You know, they don't, they take everything at face value. The, the children are quite literal until they get a little older and learn to use more words. Yeah, I've noticed that. Even when they get in their 20s, they're still more literal for my liking. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, yeah. Sometimes, uh, you know. But kids don't understand the subtleties. Their brains haven't developed to the point that they can, you know, rationalize certain things or think through certain things. They just take everything as it comes. That's how they learn. So it's important that parents pay attention to their kids when they're telling them this stuff. And... If there's paranormal activity in the house and the kid's not saying anything about it and you're saying, well, I don't want to talk about it in front of the kids, well, why not? Because if you're experiencing it, the kids are probably experiencing it. Then, too, you say you don't want to talk about it in front of them. They think there's something there to be afraid of. Not not only do they think that there's something to be afraid of, but if you dismiss them all the time and say, oh, it was just a dream or, oh, this, they're going to quit telling you what they're experiencing and they could end up in real trouble. For the spirit. So it's important that, you know, parents really pay attention to that. I mean, I did because um, if you're a medium, that's usually passed down by the mother through generations. And both my children have the ability. They've just chosen not to use it. But I was still open to them, you know, and explaining. Are you still there? Yes. Okay, I heard a crackling noise, and it's like you got quiet for a second, so I thought maybe Skype was having trouble. No, 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 that's it. We're fine. I think you heard my dog's toenails on the floor or something. So, yeah, I mean, you know, you have to pay attention to your kids when they're telling you this stuff because likely they've had a paranormal experience, and if you're having them, um, you got to talk to them about it. I mean, depending on the age, of course. Right. Now, another thing about the, the kids that I would like to point out to all the listeners, whether they thought about this or not, if you're not talking to your kids about ghosts, how do you know if they're not listening to a demon? Exactly. You don't, the only way to find out what they're dealing with is to listen to them and to talk to them and ask questions. Uh, by trying to ignore it and hope it goes away, you will be asking for all sorts of trouble. And, you know, if you got religious beliefs about it, I think I'd overcome those to find out what was going on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're, they're your kids. And, you know, as parents, you're the most powerful role models in their lives. And if you're scared, they're going to be scared. And that's why it's so important to get the fear under control, which sometimes is easier said than done. But it's vital that, you know, you, you do that, especially if you have little kids. And, you know, don't blow them off because little kids are so easily targeted. Yeah, I can see why. Uh, One other thing, though, 
uh, writing books and that, that's not all you do. You also work as a medium? Um, I do sometimes. Um, sometimes I hit the ghost, don't give me a choice. <laughs> you know, it's just the way it is. You know, you have to learn to filter it out and only let the strong ones through. Oh. Um, you know, sometimes, like, I think one of my favorite things about what I do is I went into a cemetery one day and I was do, actually doing research and this ghost came up to me. It was this adorable little old woman and she said her name was Ruby and uh, she wanted my help and she wanted to know who had her cameo brooch. So I asked her to take me to her grave, which she did. I found out who she was. I happened to know her daughter through the historical society. So at the next meeting, I asked her daughter, hey, do you know what happened to your mom's bro- cameo brooch? And she said, well, I have it. I said, okay. And I went to walk away. Well, of course, she stopped me. And I had to tell her what was going on. So we, her and I drove to the cemetery, and her, I, her mother came forward. And through me, they got to have one last conversation for an hour and a half. Wow, that's so, a long conversation. It was a long conversation, but... That was, to me, one of the most fulfilling things that I've done. You know, give a mother and daughter a chance to say all those things they couldn't say. All right. Now, I want to ask you real quick, like, what else do you do, if anything? Uh, besides writing and being a medium? Yeah. And ghost hunting? You're like, getting that um, enough? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, really? I mean, you know, I, I do have a life. You know, I, I go boating. I you know, my friends, you know, I usually run into a ghost or two when I'm out there. I mean, they're everywhere. If you see them, they're everywhere. And it leads to some interesting things. You know, sometimes if I'm around someone, uh, someone uh, who they knew that died and it just comes forward and they're in my face, then I have to, I have to tell them. So I do that a lot. Um, you know, sometimes in the grocery store, I'll walk by someone and there'll be a spirit there. And I'm like, whoa. And I have to stop and talk to them and say, hey, you know, I know this is going to sound a little unusual, but. And it's 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 interesting. It's fun. It's, um, you know, sometimes it's a little bit of a inconvenience. But, you know, I was given this gift for a reason. I feel I need to use it. I need to help as many people as I possibly can, which is another reason I write the books. Well, I, I want to I wasn't trying to pile more on you there a minute ago. I, I was basically just trying to make sure that I gave you a chance to let everybody know as much about you as you wanted to let them know, which leads to my next question uh, pretty much. Is there anything that I haven't thought to ask that you'd like to let the listeners know about? Um, I want to talk to them about sea salt. Cause there's a whole lot of stuff out there about using sea salt with negative entities. And a lot of people will say, oh, well, if you have a negative entity, put salt around your house, the outside of your house. You know, I want to say, no, don't do that, because a negative entity, for whatever reason, doesn't cross a line of salt. So if you put salt around your house, you're basically trapping the entity inside your house. You don't put salt until the entity's gone. Then use all the salt you want. I mean, that's a biggie with me. That's interesting because earlier when you were talking about the uh, things that you put into the book that you hear about people all the time, like the shoes spacing each other, et cetera, first thing I thought about because I used to watch Supernatural with my son was the salt issue. Because on that show, they use salt for almost every ghost. Yeah, I mean, I use salt a lot too, but I use it in a different way. You know, I don't want to trap the ghost and spirit in the entity, it can cross salt. It's not going to be a big deal. But if you're dealing with a negative entity, your goal is to get rid of it, not trap it in the house. So, And that's in the book, too, about the salt. You don't use salt until the entity's gone. Or you then, use to trap them into an area you want them trapped in, like a grave. Yeah, I've, yeah. I mean, I've done that. Um, you know, I've tried to, you know, if I know what room they're in, I try to confine them to a room that I, they're easier to deal with for me. But that only works for a negative entity, not your run-of-the-mill ghost. So what is it about salt, you think, that that keeps them at bay? I think that there's um, something in the natural makeup of salt 
I mean, I'm I not a chemist. I have no idea what salt's comprised of. But, you know, it comes from the earth, and it's natural, and I just, for some reason, it just seems to work with ghosts. It, mm-hmm. Not all ghosts, negative entities. Whether there's got to be something in the salt. Um, you know, like if you want to, if you don't have holy water, um, you can use olive oil, too. That's in the book, too, about olive oil. That's a big thing. But yeah, the salt. If you know, if there's one misconception out there, it's it's the salt. I mean, if I'm going to try to get rid of a negative entity, I put my team in a salt circle so that to protect them. That's not a bad idea. Yeah, I put my team and anybody else there. They go into a circle of salt. I'm the only one outside of the salt because if this thing's going to attack, I want it to come at me, not my team, and not my clients. So I'll use salt for that. All righty. A lot. Well, I show that any minute now we're going to get interrupted by break time music. So let me remind everybody real quick, like, you can learn more about her by going to www.myparanormaladvisor.com. And if you want to learn uh, or listen to other shows like Wednesday nights and Saturday afternoons, come visit me at www.talknowradio.net. Uh some of you may have missed the show I had last Thursday with uh, Philip uh, Hopersberger about his book, Exposure. And I'll be interviewing him again this Saturday if y'all want to stop by over there and lend your ear. Those of you that heard it the first time and want to hear it again, he'll be there for you. Uh, as for you, Debbie, do you have any other things you'd like to add? Any last-minute thoughts or anything real quick? Um, not really. Just you know, Thanks for having me on. Love doing your show. Okay, well, yeah, go ahead. Come visit me at the paranormal realm. Uh, yeah, matter of fact, uh, you don't happen to have a Facebook group, do you? No, no, just the realm, but people can post in there. Um, I am going to be starting a group. I just haven't come up with the right name for it yet. Uh, how about Paranormal Advisor? I might do that. I might do that <laughs> on Facebook, but no, people can... Uh, you know, they can post on my Facebook page. It's a paranormal realm, no problem. And, uh, you know, I try to post over there every day, whether it's an interesting news story about the um, paranormal. Like the last one I posted was that the Vasilla Axe Murder House is now a hotel, and it joins the list of the world's most haunted hotels, which I thought was interesting. I'd stay there. Yeah, I know. Um, oh, go ahead. Um, my new book, uh, Stalking Shadows, which are my experiences with paranormal investigator, that comes out, um, I think, September 8th. It's available for pre-order at Llewellyn's website or on Amazon. I am so glad you mentioned that because, in all honesty, I hadn't even heard of that book till you said that. Oh, well, yeah, it's just, um, it's not even released yet. It comes out in September. Oh, and, right. uh, um... The cover is on my uh, Facebook page, on the Paranormal Realms page. If you go into Amazon or Llewellyn.com and type in Stalking Shadows, it'll come up for pre-order. All right. That sounds great. I want to thank you for coming. Like I said, any minute now we're going to hear some music. I think you've done a fantastic job, and hopefully when your uh, next book comes out, we can talk about it and maybe – uh, you know, let the listeners know a little something more about it because I don't think we have time to go in depth on it today. <laughs> that'll that'll be great. I'd love to do your show then. All righty, that sounds like a winner to me, um, guys. Once again, www.talknowradio.net and www.myparanormaladvisor.com. You can also buy her book over at Amazon, and when I put her uh, show up in the archive. I will link the, have the link in the show description in the archives so that y'all can click on that and go to uh, Amazon and buy it. Please don't go straight to Amazon to buy our book if you're interested. I do get a commission off of any book sales. Uh, I'm an affiliate with Amazon. So if y'all go to my website and click on the book from there, I get a little commission off from it, and I'd appreciate that. Uh, I can't think of anything else uh, to actually fill time with other than to maybe – since I really got that two minutes left to mention real quick, I already mentioned Philip Hopper, but uh, oh, also this coming Wednesday, 
y'all might want to meet over at uh, uh, talknowradio.net. I'm going to be interviewing Tim Swartz, and the topic's going to be time travel. If y'all want to get into the chat room over there, you need a free membership. And I uh, invite y'all to go early so you'll have time to get your activation email and click on that so you don't have to hassle with it at the time of the show. And now that I hear the music, farewell, everybody. Y'all have a good one, and thanks for coming to listen. guys are hammers and to hammers everything looks like nails i heard that you were meant to so you see something that's important you call it out and we'll make it happen okay mother nature is a serial killer no one's better more creative like all serial killers she can't help the urge to want to get caught and what good are all those brilliant crimes if, if no one takes the credit so she leaves crumbs now the hard part is seeing the crumbs for the clues they are sometimes the thing you thought was the most brutal aspect turns out to be the chink in its arm and she loves disguising her weaknesses as strengths if you can fight fight head north if you can hello is there anyone out there hearing this help each other Mexico City has been declared complete